Shalom Aleichem, welcome. I'm Lisa Newman, the Yiddish Book Center's Director of Publishing and Public Programs. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Yiddish Book Center's virtual theater for tonight's program, Miriam Karpilov and the Yiddish Newspaper with Jessica Kurzain. Before we get started, a few things to mention. Your video and audio will be off throughout the program. You may send us questions via the question panel at the lower right of your computer. We ask that you keep questions short and refrain from comments so that we can try to get to all the questions this evening. I'm delighted to introduce Jessica Kurzain. Jessica is an assistant instructional professor in Yiddish in the Department of Germanic Languages at the University of Chicago and editor-in-chief of Ingeweb, a journal of Yiddish studies. Her field of study is American Jewish literature. Jessica has published or will soon be publishing articles on the ethics of representations of African Americans in American Yiddish literature, discussions of intermarriage in American Yiddish newspapers, and the religious and social evolutionary thinking in intermarriage narratives in San Francisco Jewish writer Emma Wolf and her contemporaries. She's the translator of three works by Miriam Karpilov, Diary of a Lonely Girl, or The Battle Against Free Love, Judith, and the forthcoming A Provincial Newspaper and Other Stories. Always a pleasure to welcome you. Jessica, a familiar yep. face uh, in many respects at the Yiddish Book Center, but your translations are wonderful. I'm eager to hear your program tonight. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Lisa, for having me. And thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm just going to share my screen so that we can get started with this presentation. Um, I'm really happy to have a chance to tell you about, um, about Miriam Karpilov and her work. So Miriam Karpilov, her, uh, Miriam Karpilov's satirical novella, a provincial newspaper, um, which was published in 1926, centers on an overlooked writer of a, pop, a popular serialized, sorry, centers on an overworked writer of popular serialized fiction and journalist for a small-time regional Yiddish newspaper in Boston. In one scene, this narrator contrasts the romantic vision of the romance writer with the realities of being a newspaper woman. She says, this is how I get ready to write. I sat in a light summery dress that was so thin that the breeze passing between the door and the window came right to me. I felt comfortable. I felt prepared to accomplish a lot of work, but then, the telephone. Who was it? What did he want? It was Mr. Rat, and he wanted me to come into the editorial office. What, on a Sunday? Miriam Karpilov holds no punches. She tells her readers about her narrator's poor wages, long hours, lack of respect. She doesn't even have a desk in the newspaper office on which, on which to write her novels and editorials. Karpilov does all this through snappy dialogue sardonic humor, deflating readers' lofty expectations about the writing life with a dose of reality and also a dose of hilarity. Think The Office set in a Yiddish newspaper in Boston. Miriam Karpilov knew what she was talking about. She was a prolific Yiddish writer, a pioneer newspaper woman whose work focused attention on women's lives and, in, and the inequality they experience in the workplace and in romantic relationships. These are some advertisements uh, for various novels by Miriam Karpilov. Miriam Karpilov wrote hundreds of short stories, plays, and novels, most of, most of which were published in New York-based newspapers. As the newspaper Der Tog described her when advertising one of her novels in 1925, her name is a guarantee that the novel will be captivating. Her enormous output spanned decades, and a provincial new in, in a provincial newspaper, she gives a somewhat bitter inside peek at what her work life might have sometimes felt like behind the scenes. Miriam Karpilov was born near Minsk in what is now Belarus and was then in the Russian Empire, a middle child in a family of 10 children. She immigrated to the United States in 1905, settling in Harlem and later in the Seagate neighborhood of Brooklyn and finally in Bridgeport, Connecticut, which had been a home base for much of her adult life because of the family that she had living there. Karpilov's first published work appeared in 1906, and she continued her publishing career until the mid-1940s. 
Yet, despite her prolific output in the Yiddish press, her work received almost no critical attention in her lifetime or thereafter. This is what makes my volume of translations uh, something different than bringing a, one text admired in one language to an audience who wishes to access it in another. It's a work of literary recovery, much like many of the works that the Yiddish Book Center supports, and helps us set the record straight about women who wrote in Yiddish despite their previous erasure. This translation is part of a veritable wave of translations and scholarship that are now making it all but impossible to think of Yiddish literature as a field occupied solely by men. Though little more than a decade ago, syllabi of Yiddish literature were likely to include only a handful of female identifying poets if they included women at all. My recent volume, which was published in September, is actually the third book that I've translated by Miriam Karpolov. I had previously translated Karpolov's 1911 debut novel, Judith, uh, and which, was, which is an epistolary romance between a small town girl and the dashing revolutionary she falls in love with who continuously disappoints her. I'd also published a translation of what was likely her most famous work, her 1916 novel, Diary of a Lonely Girl, which launched her career as a famous author through depicting the dangers and disappointments faced by a single woman living and dating in New York City. When I translated Diary of a Lonely Girl, I immediately felt it important that I not stop with the one book. I didn't like the idea of it sitting alone on a shelf with Karpolov known only as the author of the diary when the truth of Karpolov's output was much messier reams and reams of newsprint, some, sometimes written for the tastes of readers or editors, handwritten manuscripts that were never published, including self-translations into English that never made it beyond Karpolov's own desk. What was most striking to me about Karpolov was not only the content of her novels and stories, but the sheer volume of them. In a sense, translating only one novel felt like a mistranslation of Karpolov's output. She wasn't a one-hit wonder. In fact, in 1922, a few years before she published a provincial newspaper, another of her novellas, Bruche, was panned by a critic in one of the rare acts of criticism that she received by saying, Miriam Karpolov has a specific place in American Yiddish fiction with her own settings, characters, and way of writing. All of her characters are the same lonely girls. They may dress differently and have different names, but they all bear the writer's stamp. Although this critic was complaining about Karpolov as a one-trick pony, we might otherwise read between the lines to see that she had built a name for herself as representative of the lonely girls who might otherwise have been overlooked in Yiddish literature. And part of what she was known for was the number of variations she made on that theme. The Yiddish writer who was the main character of Karpolov's A Provincial Newspaper, the title of which is pictured here in this slide, is like Karpolov already an established writer whose name draws readers to the newspaper when we meet her at the start of the novel. As she explains with refreshingly unapologetic self-confidence to the editor who recruits her to the Boston paper, my novels are widely read. Having accepted a position with wages so low that she's embarrassed to say the sum out loud, Karpolov's protagonist packs her bags and foots the bill for her own train ticket from New York to Boston to work for a newly established newspaper. There she finds editors who care more about sales than the quality of their writing, demeaning working conditions, and a community of Americanizing potential readers who want nothing to do with Yiddish. Karpolov's writing echoes her life. Yiddish newspapers at this time were eager to hire a select few women writers onto their otherwise entirely male staffs in order to draw in women readers and a broader popular audience and the newspapers prominently displayed the names of women writers as an attractive feature of a fresh modern newspaper. Yet, as I yell it, as a historian at Ayelet Brin has detailed, women who worked for Yiddish newspapers in the early 20th century often found that the scope of their writing was limited to so-called women's features, advice columns, human interest pieces, poetry and short stories focusing on women's lives and their presumed interests, or they took on behind the scenes roles as secretaries, office workers, and translators, amounting to what Bryn calls the hidden history of unattributed work that women performed for the Yiddish press. All of this is reflected in Karpolov's novella. Karpolov's 
protagonist is required to take on tasks far beyond what is officially in her contract. Six days a week, one day off, writing articles and editing the women's section. That's all, as she complains to her editor. In actuality, she's called upon not only to edit, but also to write all of the content for the women's pages, writing that will be largely uncredited. While her well-known name, plastered across the pages of the journal, is meant to attract readers, still much of her work for the newspaper is unacknowledged and uncompensated. Conducting interviews, writing advice columns, translating fashion notices from the English newspapers, penning jokes and aphorisms and musings, reportage and, and composing gossip-oriented articles. It's more than a reasonable workload, and new assignments keep piling up at the editor's whims. Meanwhile, her boss treats her outrageously, at one point even measuring her columns with a ruler in order to prove that her work is insufficient and insisting that her novels don't count as work. He dictates the subject and style of her writing, insisting that she make her novels more scandalous and that her articles double as advertisements for the newspaper itself. His arguments and demands are so vociferous and unpleasant that at times she gives in for the sake of escaping him. Quote, so instead of refusing more work, I ended up promising to do even more, Harper Love's protagonist recounts. All the while, despite her acquiescing to these unreasonable demands, Karpilov's protagonist remains confident in the merit of her own writing. From the first moment that she sits down with an editor, we know we are in the hands of a woman who can hold her own. When her editor suggests that the newspaper might reprint one of her earlier novels and that no one will know because they will have forgotten some of her earlier work, she retorts, they'll know. It's hard for me to believe that people, even people outside the city could have forgotten even the first of my novels. Throughout the novella, she has a strong sense of herself as an author who should be valued and treated with respect, who is above the kind of work that she is being asked to do, and who can, who, who can and will find work elsewhere. Though it's a record of an unequal workplace, Karpolov's novella is also a victory for the capable woman who not only endures those conditions, but excels within them and manages to escape. A Provincial Newspaper is the title story of my recent book of translations, but the book also contains many other gems, and I want to tell you a little bit about these, too. On September 1st, 1926, Miriam Karpilov left New York to settle in Palestine with her brother and his extended family. In a letter to Chaim Lieberman, secretary of the I.L. Peretz Writers' Union, Karpilov wrote about the upcoming journey and made it clear that it was precipitated at least in part by her frustrations working for Yiddish newspapers, as described in her novella, A Provincial Newspaper. The Writers' Union, and here's a copy of the letter, she complains in an ironic roundabout turn of phrase, always helped me to not to forget to remember that I must understand that writing is an art and not a job and left me free to enjoy my freedom so I could depend on being independent. In other words, Karpilov did not have steady employment despite her many years writing for Yiddish papers, which as she points out, I have so honorably served for more than 20 years. I've earned a Jubilee celebration, right? Feeling slighted and undervalued, and with the promise of sharing in her brother's passion for the Zionist settler movement on the horizon, she left her beloved New York behind. The chapters of her memoir that I translated, the title page of which is uh, on this slide, um, are the first seven chapters of what presumably was a much longer manuscript detailing her time in Palestine. Unfortunately, only the first seven and a half chapters of this manuscript remain in her archive at Evo. These chapters focus largely on her arrival and first impressions, as well as her observations of her travel companions. They're an intriguing historical record told with Karpilov's signature attention to humorous detail. When Karpilov and her family disembark from their steamship in the Jaffa port, they're immediately confronted with, the, with discussion of the financial and economic crisis in British Mandatory Palestine in 1926, which led to large unemployment, a slowing of Jewish immigration, social discontent, and growing tensions between the Jewish and Arab communities. Karpilov brings this slowing of new immigration to life in her memoir, and she describes how the owner of the hotel where she was staying climbs to the roof of the hotel each morning to look out over the docks in the hope of seeing new immigrants arriving on steamships and is routinely disappointed. In her memoirs, Karpilov details how she and her family are treated with incredulity for arriving during the crisis, even as the Jewish settlers they encounter in Palestine are desperate to receive more immigrants. 
The British immigration officers were surprised that American citizens with money had come to settle in Palestine. Is it so bad in America or so good in Eretz Yisrael that Jews would want to settle here, especially during the present crisis? When asked why they came to America, Karpolov explains to the customs official, historical connections, you know? In the memoir, Karpolov represents, through her various family members, competing ideological commitments about the, the settlement in Palestine. Karpolov's uncle Shmuel sees his pilgrimage to the land of Israel as a religious one. He plans to take part in the study of sacred texts in Jerusalem and looks down on modern Zionist accomplishments such as the building of Tel Aviv. The rest of Karpolov's family, however, do not have religious aspirations, and they hardly set foot in Jerusalem, setting their sights on new areas of settlement, such as Tel Aviv and the Carmel neighborhood of Haifa, and the modern apparently secularized Zionism that they represent. Still, Karpolev is skeptical of labor Zionist culture, as represented particularly by her cousin Moshe. Karpolev herself is devoted to Zionism, but as with all her ideological commitments, she approaches politics with a grain of salt. When her cousin Moshe takes her on a tour of Tel Aviv, she does not wax ecstatic for the newly erected buildings. Moshe pointed at the buildings. It's like they grew here overnight. Look at them, nice, right? My brother and his wife nodded in agreement. Very nice. But I wanted to know why they, the buildings that is, were so exposed to the outside without any awnings or front yards. They looked rather prosaic. Not enough stores and too many little storefronts here. It makes the whole thing look cheap. I didn't need to say anything more. Moshe, and with him, Aaron, were furious with me. Karbalev sees the flaws in a city that is only half built, and in pointing them out, she takes the wind out of the sails of Moshe's self-congratulatory triumphalist Zionism. Later on, as she allows Moshe to bloviate on his attitudes toward Arab workers or his certainty of Jewish success, Karbalev gives her character the opportunity to demonstrate that his enthusiasm for the cause has pushed him ad absurdum until he discredits himself and exposes the chauvinism of the, of the Zionism he espouses. Now, Karpolev herself is certainly not exempt from chauvinism or racism, and there are whole passages of the memoir that deal in troubling racist and Orientalist representations, comparing Arabs to animals with pre-verbal tongue clicking and repeatedly depicting Arabs as lazy, slovenly, and unsanitary. It's important to note Karpolev's racism in the text, particularly because she sees herself as outside the more ideologically strident Yet, as a Westerner set in, settling in the Orient, the so-called Orient, she, she succumbs all too easily to prevalent Orientalist sentiment. Three years after her arrival in Palestine, having failed to make ends meet, Karpolev returned to the United States. And this is a picture of a tapestry that she herself, um, some needlework that she made herself. Um, in 1929, in a letter to famed poet Ida Maza, Karpolev confided that she hoped her health would allow her to return to Eretz Israel though as far as the archive record, archival record shows, that hope was never realized. Upon their deaths, Karpolov and her brother Jacob both left their estates to the Jewish National Fund. Karpolov's archive at YIVO contains several scrapbooks of newspaper clippings of her writings, embellished with montages of photographs and magazine clippings of bright and varied illustrations. Among these is a scrapbook that begins Selected Stories, with a table of contents listing 19 of the many stories that she published in the forwards in the 1930s. My volume honors Karpolov's wishes by reproducing all 19 of what seem to have been her favorites from this period. Each of these stories is attentive to lively dialogue and ends with a tight, tidy resolution. Many of them are attuned to the experiences and love lives of older women, divorcees and widows, whose romantic decisions are also pragmatic ones about the kind of domestic labor and living situations that they want to pursue. Several of the stories contain themes Karpolov explores in a provincial newspaper. For a bit of respect and the invitation are, set up, are send ups of a hapless Yiddish writer who yearns for an audience who will celebrate his work and of the Yiddish reading public who have no interest in proper literature. A kosher swimming pool and the shadchan hinge on the mutual incomprehensibility between young Jewish seagoers who don't know or respect Yiddish language, and Yiddish language and customs, and traditionally observant Jewish men. Uh, uh, sorry, and a traditionally observant Jewish man who is out of touch with the culture of the younger generation. These stories, written to be read around kitchen tables, 
reflected the daily lives and interests of the Yidd of Yiddish newspaper readers. They showcase a broad range of themes from internal classes, classism and racism within the Jewish community to the performative hysterics of an overbearing wife. Some offer predictable structures in which confusions are introduced and then resolved, while others end with more ambiguity. Each features the assertive voice that readers knew to expect every time they saw Karpolov's byline on the printed page. One example um, of a story that I wanna kind of bring out for you is called Old Sarah, it was published in July, 1937. And that story describes a woman's experiences when her children send her to live in an old age home. I'm gonna read you part of the story just so you can get a flavor for a sense of Miran Karpolov's voice uh, in general and also in particular in these very short stories um, that were published later in her writing career. Bear with me, I um, have to find the right page. <laughs> okay, so this is a story called Old Sarah, uh, published in the Forbarts on July 4th, 1937. And I'll just read you from the beginning of it. The whole way home, the whole way from her home to the old age home, old Sarah couldn't stop crying. Her daughter and grandson, who drove her in their automobile, exchanged worried glances and shared a heavy silence. It pained the daughter to see her mother wipe her old, weepy eyes, but there was nothing she could do to help. She couldn't keep her mother in her house, and neither could her brothers or sisters. She needed someone to take care of her and help her, like a child. She couldn't see when she walked, and she might fall. She couldn't hear, and she was always asking what this or that person had said. When she came to visit, she would lose track of the conversation and say things that people nowadays wouldn't say. When it started to get late at night, she told the girls, her granddaughters, when they stayed up late with boys, it's not healthy to stay up so late. The young people couldn't stand it. They wanted to stay up late as late as they pleased. She should be in an old age home, they said. The daughter, driving her mother to the old age home, offered encouragement, saying that her mother would be happier there. She'd have company. She'd like it so much there that she wouldn't want to leave. And if she didn't like it, then the daughter would take her back home. I think it'd be good for her there. You'll see, she said. The director of the home had promised to take special care of her. She wasn't a charity case after all. The cost was closer to a hotel than a boarding house. And she could have some money all to herself too, in case she wanted to buy something or go see a movie. They had parties in the home. They took photographs of the oldest res residents and everybody celebrated them for their long lives. The daughter told the mother all this, but the cheerful talk only made matters worse. The old lady felt that she was no longer of any use to her children, that they liked her better when she's somewhere far away. She was only in their way. They wanted to be rid of her, so they were putting her in an old age home. And it was all because of the money that her husband had left her, her second husband, the first one, the father of all her children, had died years ago and left her a widow. For years, she was with her children because her children couldn't get on without her. She helped them raise their children. She was everyone's servant. She never had a moment to herself. But then a widower showed up with his own house, with a store and money in the bank and married children who needed a woman to run his household. She asked her children what to do when they said that it wasn't such a bad idea to have her own house in her old age. They wouldn't stand in the way of her living her own life. She left to run her own household and be a servant to the old man and his grown children. Truth be told, he didn't know what to do with her and the children were respectful to her. But it was hard for her to work, to cook and bake and clean for a house full of people with large appetites. And she still had to do things for her own children from time to time. They often came to visit her. She wasn't far away. When they were with her, they could eat to their heart's content. Yet, yes, they usually brought their own provisions, fish or chicken, but she had to cook it for them. She made them noodles, barfel, cabbage, pickles, and cherry brandy. They couldn't make it as well as she did, so they let her do it. And she was happy that, their, that her children needed her, that she could do something for them. Her husband was pleased too. He was good to her children. He gave presents to her grandchildren. He was happy that they called him uncle and grandpa and came to visit often. He was a good man, a kind man, but his age and years of hard work took a toll on his death on his health. Sarah became his nursemaid. Because she attended to him, he continued on for a long time. 
a glimmer of his former self. She simply wouldn't allow him to die. She didn't want to be a widow again. But in the end, all her desires for him to go on living were of no use. He died. He left a will, a sum of several thousand dollars from which his wife, Sarah, could draw however much she needed to live on for as long as she would live. Everyone said that it was a generous will. Even Sarah's children said so, even though they would have been more pleased if she had received several thousand dollars all at once and allowed them to invest it in their own businesses. But since that might have caused conflict between the children, maybe it was better this way. The house and the business that the husband left behind went to his, his children. Sarah could continue to manage the household for them as she had before if she wanted to, but she didn't have the energy for that anymore and decided to live out the rest of her life alone somewhere in a room in one of her children's houses. She went to live with one child after another and nothing worked out. The family consulted with one another and decided that the best place for her would be an old age home. So here she was on her way to the home with tears streaming down her cheeks. She was embarrassed about her tears, but she couldn't help it. The tears kept on falling of their own accord. So you can see there the really sympathetic portrayal of this woman's experience, um, possibly an experience that resonated with many of the readers of the Forverts at that time, um, and also possibly one that wasn't well represented um, elsewhere than, than in her stories. In sum, working on this volume has given me a peek behind the scenes in the life of an important, if overlooked, Yiddish news, newspaper writer in the form of memoir and fictionalized semi-autobiographical writing, as well as the selection of the kind of short story writing that was the bread and butter of her vast literary output. Together they create a portrait of an author who took her own humorous writing seriously, took men in power with a grain of salt and always looked at the world through rolled eyes. Here's just a, an image of the most recent translation of Provincial Newspaper and Other Stories together with the two other volumes so you can get a sense of what the, the complete uh, set looks like of the, the translations that exist at least so far of Miriam Karpolo. And I wanted to just show you one more thing before I, uh, I turn it over to Q&A, um, which is, this is a, an image from Miriam Karpolo's archive. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Miriam Karpolo kept several scrapbooks that then made their way into their ar her archive. And in the scrapbooks, there are pictures of Miriam Karpolo, there are pictures of her family, the kinds of things that you might expect to see in a scrapbook. Um, there are also pictures of things that she found beautiful, many, many red flowers and roses, which seems to have been um, just one of her favorite images, um, but also things like statues or um, images of natural beauty. Um, and in addition, there, uh, there's, there are newspaper clippings of just about everything that she ever wrote. Um, and so it's a really extraordinary resource. And the reason that I wanted to point it out to you uh, in particular is because you can see that, that um, the cover to the most recent translation is modeled off of her um, scrapbooking practice, which I think is just really lovely. Um, so I wanted to, to share that tidbit with you. Um, so that is what I have for you. And I am very excited to answer any questions that you might have. Um, Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing, Miriam, with all of us. Each one of these volumes gets better and better and better. Um, so a couple of quick questions. Um, uh, how was her work received? So there's there are a few ways that we can know the answer to that question. One is that um, her books, she has five published um, volumes that appear, appeared in book form. Uh, my sense is that it's fairly unusual for um, something that's serialized in the newspaper to then appear in book form. And so just the fact of the existence of especially something like The Diary of a Lonely Girl suggests its popularity. Um, we can also guess at it because of the, the frequency with which she was published and the way that her, her name was used to sell newspapers. Um, so look out next week for another wonderful book by Miriam Karpolov suggest that a lot of people were reading her um, because it was a it was um, a selling point. Uh, but I don't have any real knowledge in terms of numbers of readers. 
uh, nor is there anything like a critical reception. I shared with you the writing of one critic. That's actually the only critic that I've found uh, was this one negative review of Brugge. Um, and so it's hard to say, you know, what did critics say about her, except to say that they didn't say anything about her, which maybe um, tells you something about the status of the genre she was writing in, the kind of um, mm -hmm. world of like middle brow popular literature, which wasn't, didn't get the same kind of treatment. Um, or maybe the, the way that in particular women writers uh, were treated by male critics. I'm happy to say that thanks to you and bringing her to the forefront, um, she will be included in our upcoming exhibition, Yiddish a Global Culture, because she's great. And, and there's a wonderful story about that first book coming in, which is so rare, um, a copy of it. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the process and challenges of translating her work? Yeah. Um, so, well, I'll start with maybe just what, what happens when I sit down to translate her work. And I'll say that it has, my process has changed over time because, um, when I started translating her, I didn't know her writing very well. And so, um, I had to spend a lot of time trying to kind of figure out well, what, what tone does she have here? What's, what is she doing here? Feels, is it, supposed to be sort of melancholy or is it making fun of the idea of being sort of melancholy like where's the line between the serious and the humorous um and a lot of times when you're translating translating is always an act of, an inter of interpretation and you just have to decide what do you think she's saying if you can't if you yourself can't make a decision if you're not sure then it'll come out muddled to your readers and it just won't work so you just have to decide she's trying to be funny here and I'm going to be funny or she's not trying to be funny she's trying to be very serious here and I will also be very serious um so I used to spend sort of more time on that question um and now that I've translated so much of her and read so much of her I have just more of an instinct or um a feel for her as a writer that mm -hmm. makes her I translate her I find her much easier to translate than anyone else though I do translate other people uh because I feel like I have I, I have created a voice for her. I have a kind of internal voice for her that I can uh, reproduce or I can kind of predict how I think she would say things. Um, so yeah, so that it has changed a little bit. Um, some of the things that are particularly difficult in translating her, um, one is that she's very, very dialogue heavy. Um, in some ways her short stories and that her novels can feel a little bit more like scripts than like novels. They're low on description. They're very heavy in dialogue. Uh, and so trying to keep it lively, to keep it, make it sound like something that a person would say. And also a little bit like pinning something delicate between making it sound like it could have been said in say 1930 and making it sound like something that doesn't feel so antiquated that today's readers would read it and say, no one would ever say that. And so kind of walking that tightrope so it doesn't feel anachronistic, but it also doesn't feel old fashioned. Uh, that's been a real challenge. Um, and the other is um, the way that she calls attention to multilingualism. Uh, so I quoted her saying uh, to the British um, official who's who's uh who's challenging them as they come into Palestine you know why are you here during this crisis why wouldn't you stay in America and she says um historical connections you know but actually the the character says that in English um and not in in Yiddish so she kind of she switches to English to make this like kind of gutsy ironic comment um and so in that case, I, I actually didn't draw attention to the changes in language, but some in some places I do have to kind of put in parentheses she said in English or kind of like think about what is the relationship between my readers and the language that they're reading in and between Miriam Karpolov and the languages that she's representing in her text. I, I have to um, ask you this question as you're talking about her and finding her voice as her translator as well. Um, you've shared with us and we've gotten some just wonderful pictures of her and there's an irreverence there's a a sense of uh she was quite present yeah. and and um a bit theatrical and all of that I imagine she was wonderful to know and I wonder if you draw some sense of how you might approach 
some of that translation to find that line between um, humor, um, irreverence, or what have you. Does any of that influence it, seeing her, since you can't speak to her? Yeah, I mean, I think that I have, whether it's true to who she actually was or not, I've pulled together through various kinds of material, personal letters mm -hmm. and pictures of her and all of the reading that I've done of things that she wrote in the newspaper, a kind of like composite picture. I have a sense in my mind of her as a person. Um, and then I can kind of, as it were, ask that person, like, would you really say that? Like, mm -hmm. I know that you don't feel that way about this, or I know you would never, you would never say this without a tone of flippancy because I know you, you're my friend now. And I know that you make fun of everyone. So like, this can't possibly be, uh, serious. And so I, I guess there is some of it is the photographs. Um, and a lot of it is the the writing itself, where I have this feeling that I, I, an instinct that I know what she more or less what she feels about things. And I can come in, I think probably the way that many of us do with many of our favorite writers, right? Like you, you once know a writer fairly well, you already know what to expect before you open the book and you're waiting for it and you're looking for it. And that's that's how I've um, come to feel about her as well. Huh. Um, did she have a relationship with other women writers of the time, Yidd or Yiddish writers or others? Uh, she certainly did. Um, she seems to have been in a kind of clique of especially humorist writers um, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, and it, and so that she she was very it was a social world that she was part of of Yiddish writers and Yiddish literati and um, also I think uh, the theatrical world to a certain degree as well. Um, in terms of specific people, there are letters between her and Ida Maza. There are letters between her and um, Rose Schomer Bachelitz, who was uh, Schomer's daughter. Mm -hmm. um, there are um, there are you know letters here and there but she's a letter between her and Bertha um and so there's a sense that she kept in touch with had a had a correspondence with a variety of people but there's nothing really sustained at least in the archive these are just individual letters or one or two letters um as opposed to a kind of like lifelong conversation that I have a record of it seems like the person the people that she was really the most in correspondence with are actually her brother and her sister-in-law um, who she was very, very close with. And most of her archive uh, in terms of personal correspondence is actually letters between her and her brother and her sister-in-law. In Diary of a Lonely Girl, the protagonist is often fending off male anarchists, adherents of, quote, free love. Do you know if Miriam ever met Emma Goldman and discussed with her the doctrine of free love? I don't know if she met her personally. She was uh, certainly like are in the air and she's uh certainly referencing Emma Goldman in um a lot of the the texts that she's writing and she wrote uh Miriam Karpola wrote for anarchist newspapers um they among you know a variety she wrote in a variety of newspapers with different political um affiliations but certainly Kaya Arbuchestima was one of the places that she regularly wrote for um so she was definitely reading Emma Goldman she was definitely encountering a lot of other people who were reading a lot of Emma Goldman and going to mass meetings. And I, if someone showed me a photograph of Miriam Karpolov at an Emma Goldman rally, I would be like very unsurprised. Um, but I don't know for certain if they met each other. Um, sort of along the same lines, Diary of a Lonely Girl is a screed against free love advocated by radicals in the 1910s. What do you know of her exposure to the radical community of the 19 teens who advocated free love? Yeah. Um, first of all, I'm not sure if I would say it's a screed um, because I think much more than that, it's actually a little bit gentler than that. Though it is a criticism, I think it is a, it's poking fun at. Um, it's, I think it's needling. And my sense is that it's needling people who were near and dear to her, that she is part of uh, a radical leftist community, kind of bohemian community. But Miriam Karpolov doesn't like anyone who takes themselves too seriously. So she's a labor Zionist, but she makes fun of her cousin, the labor Zionist, right? She's 
anyone who has a kind of like earnestness, um, especially if she sees some kind of hypocritical uh, behavior, she really kind of digs into that. So I think it's much more um, intimate than a screed would be. I think a screed would be like looking at the dis at, from a distance and and um, and calling some a group of people, um, you know, inherently bad or something like that. But mm -hmm. I think this is actually it feels to me much closer um, than that. And um, and yes, I think she was very involved in radical circles, um, and she was writing for a number of um, of radical um, or left wing uh, newspapers. That's where most of her writing came out. Um, so uh, the the provincial newspaper first comes out in Gerechtigkeit, which is the uh, the publication of the um, lady ladies garment workers union. Um, so yeah, I, I these are people that she she's writing about people she knew. Probably she's she may even be quoting or or uh, or basing her characters upon people that she has sat in her own bedroom and tried to fend off. Who knows. Oh, how much do you think her stance regarding free love and therefore women's independence and unwillingness to participate in the escapades of males of the day affected her treatment at the male-dominated forwards? It's hard to know. Uh, I I suspect that she was pretty um, self-confident and uh, that may not have gone over particularly well with um, all editors. Um, a few things that I do know about her experience with the Forverts. One is that she has a letter in her archive asking pretty early on in something like, I think, 1920, something like that, um, a letter to Ab Khan asking him to take her on as a staff writer. And she, at that point, did not become a staff writer. So she was interested in working for the Forverts long before she got um, work working for the Forverts. And she I think went to the former's office and handed um, her stories in and um, they weren't often accepted there until uh, later in her career in the thirties. Um, so um, I don't know what that, that means in terms of the question, but that's maybe helpful information in context. Um, the other thing I know is that there, there, I read one memoir saying that Ab Kahan had asked someone to essentially steal some of her work and rewrite it under their own name because he didn't like her, but he liked her stories. Um, I think this is something that sort of was frequently happening in the Yiddish newspaper industry um, and maybe not so much about Miriam Karpolov herself as about the kind of um, nature of the industry, um, but, but also maybe suggest that she was not a well-loved individual by editors, um, which wouldn't surprise me because she seems a little bit prickly to me. <laughs> um, so you might not have wanted to have di had dinner with her. Um, it, sort of a related question, um, was it unusual for a woman to be a newspaper writer, reporter, what have you? Uh, yes and no. I, I uh, Many newspapers did have women writers. Um, they had them for particular purposes, right? So they had women writers who would write um, fiction, ideally for, or that was with a presumed women audience. And that was what Miriam Karpolov was uh, for many of these newspapers, um, was the woman writer for the, for the newspaper and the one who was there to um, attract women readers. Um, and sometimes the newspaper would have one or two such writers or, or a handful, um, though the majority of the, the people writing for the newspaper were male. So she fits in. She's not um, singular. She fits into a category. There were a number of writers uh, like her. So Yanta Serdatsky uh, is one. Um, Anna Margolin, who wrote under Rosa Levenboim when she was um, writing for the newspaper. That was another one that was sort of Sarah Smith, there's a, a, a number of women who, who fit into this category. Um, a woman named Rachel Loria, who's not as well known because she died rather young, but whose name was mentioned alongside Miriam Karpolov's uh, on several occasions. Um, what drew you to her work? I found her by accident, by uh, searching in the Yiddish Book Center's um, uh, search function before we before even OCR, when it was just the titles of books, um, I was looking for a help with a footnote for my dissertation about free love. 
I typed in the words Freie Liebe, which means free love. Uh, and the second hit was Miriam Karpilov's <laughs> Diary of a Lonely Girl or the Battle Against Free Love. So I started by finding it and reading it, um, which is to say my finding it could never have happened without the labor of people who both kept this book and digitized this book um, and made it publicly available. Um, so to so both I happened to have found it and also it was very intentional that it existed on the internet for me to find. Um, and uh, yeah, and I started reading it to help with this footnote and then it was hilarious and so good. And um, I fell more and more in love with the writer the more I read of her. Um, I think I'm going to take this as the last question, um, which has a little comment, but we'll allow for that. Um, thank you uh, for all of your dedication to this, Jessica. I love learning about the newly discovered author and your evolving process. In your opinion, which of Miriam's interesting stories, which book would more easily appeal to a contemporary audience? Oh, gosh. Is that like asking, asking someone to take their thing? Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess it depends what you like, right? So Judith, uh, which I don't know, my, here's Judith, my background is blurred, so it's hard to see, but um, Judith is um, her first novel and it's a little bit less funny, a little bit more earnest and melodramatic. Um, and it's a novel in letters. I really like it because um, it has a kind of like youthful mm. energy to it. Um, Diary of a Lonely Girl, I think, uh, has really resonated, especially among um, university students. I think it echoes in a lot of ways the lives of students living in um, university environments, and dorm rooms, and so forth, and the kind of dating culture. It um, has a kind of Me Too resonance, um, and so it's really been quite successful, especially in that um, audience. And I think that I think that especially the short stories at the end of a provincial newspaper, these very short stories, that's what I told my grandmother, my own grandmother to read. She said, which of these, um, which of your translations should I read? And I said, well, you know, I, I think you will like these short stories um, because they address a kind of more mature audience. Great. Well, um, as always, thank you, Jessica. I hope you continue your work translating, but I know you will, teaching and all the other myriad things that you do. And so hope to see you back at the center again soon. It was great to connect with you when you were at the center teaching this summer. So thanks again. Um, all of the thank books um, are available at chop.yiddishbookcenter.org and elsewhere where fine books are sold. So get a copy, you'll enjoy it. <laughs> thanks again. I wanna thank tonight's uh, producer, our always producer, Elizabeth Carteropoli, for all she does to bring this uh, program to the airwaves. Tonight's program is part of the Yiddish Book Center's ongoing series of public programs. I hope you'll join us on Thursday, October 5th at 7 p.m. when I will be in conversation with David Mazauer, Chief Curator of the Yiddish Book Center's forthcoming landmark permanent exhibition, Yiddish a Global Culture, which opens on Sunday, October 15th. And you can join us in person at the center for the big celebration that day. To see the full schedule of events and to register for our programs, visit yiddishbookcenter.org slash programs. Before I let you leave, I want to say a big hearty thank you from all of us at the center to all of the members and donors who make our ongoing work possible. Learn more about how you can join and support our efforts by visiting yiddishbookcenter.org slash donate. Hope to see you Thursday the 5th at 7 p.m. and also at the center when we reopen to the public with Yiddish, a global culture. Thanks. Enjoy the evening and best to you in the new year. <laughs>